seems to be doing something. Okay, uh, welcome again. Thanks for being here. Um, if you are not a, if you if you're not interested in the session, you can move off into the lunch area. That's fine. But if you're interested in the session, then sit. Uh, okay, here's what we're gonna do, and I want to make sure you understand what what we're gonna cover and the angle it comes from. I wanted to do a session on DSC resource design, not from a coding perspective. This isn't so much about syntax. This is a before you start coding to sit down and design. But this is not like my personal recommendation. This isn't uh, formal best practices. There's honestly a lot of people still figuring out what the practices are. This is the designs that I've seen customers that I've worked with kind of come up with. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what problems they were trying to solve. And I'll talk about the approaches they took. And I'll talk a little bit about where their approaches may have fallen short of their goals still. Because this is still very much an open space. This is stuff that people are still trying to figure out. So if nothing else, this is just designed as kind of to shortcut you past the mistakes some other people have already made. And it might not take you all the way to a solution yet, but it will at least get you closer to the solution perhaps than starting from scratch yourself. So push the button. I, we did that. We pushed <laughs> the button. You can't say it halfway through. A um, bit about myself, I've been an MVP since 2003, uh, shifted over to being a PowerShell MVP I think in 2006 when the product was announced. Uh, I've written a lot of different PowerShell books and articles, things like that. Um, uh, the lead author for the DSC book, which is a free ebook on PowerShell.org if you haven't run across that yet. Uh, and I'm one of the co-founders of PowerShell.org. So that's me. Here's what we'll cover. Really this is again about patterns. Things that people have, have attempted and they've tried and what's worked and what hasn't worked and the ways in which it has and has not worked for them. Uh, all intended, and this is the big deal here, None of this is supposed to necessarily make writing resources any easier. It's supposed to make testing and debugging those resources a little easier. And, and we'll get into some specifics about why. While also encouraging modularization, which is generally held to just be a good thing because it you know, reduces your redundancy in your code, it can make maintenance easier, it can make it easier to split the job amongst many different developers and, and combine together to form Voltron instead of some misshapen thing. Um, so that's what a lot of this is designed to do. Most of this is from the version 4, so the current shipping out there in the real world version of DSC, because that's what's out there in the real world. I don't have any customers using version 5 in production because you're not allowed to. It's against its licensing agreement, despite what I know all of you are doing. Um, so some of this stuff does change a little bit. Version 5 is, is bringing some changes that actually help fix some of the things that these customers were trying to fix. But a lot of this is still very applicable, I, th I think, in version 5, at least from what we've seen so far of version 5. I'm really, again, not going to focus on syntax. And I think that will actually help keep this version neutral. Um, how many of you have worked on a DSC resource in version 4? So just for those who haven't, to summarize, it's basically a script module, so it's a single text file, and it's got at least three functions that have special names, and that's what DSC looks for when it goes to test your configuration to see if it's compliant, to set it into compliance, or to get the current configuration. Now as we move into five, that basic structure still stays the same, it's just it gets defined as a class with methods inside of it as opposed to three specially named functions. So it gets a little bit more, more structure around it. So we're going to try and ignore the syntactical versions and just focus on that structure. Now the problem that the majority of these folks were trying to solve was really around testing and debugging and maintenance. In version 4, testing an individual resource can be a little bit difficult. Here's how almost everybody starts. I wrote the resource. I deploy it to a target node, usually through the expedient of simply copying the files, because that's where I'm going to test it. And then I come up with a configuration that uses my resource. I compile that into a moth, and I push the moth over there, and then I hope for the best. When it invariably does not work the first time, <coughs> you don't always get a lot of debugging information out of it. So depending on how you wrote the thing, if you have verbose messages or you chose to log things, you're kind of looking in a few different places, but it's a little bit ad hoc. What these customers said was, we want to try and find a way so that we can, we can really test the resource 
just as a set of standalone functions and take DSC completely out of it. I want to be able to sit on a target node and I want to be able to run the test and the set and the get just there interactively in the console. Knowing that that is not exactly duplicating what the local configuration manager does, but it's a good way to just get rid of the majority of your bugs right away in a, a, a fashion that feels a little bit more like the function authoring process that we're used to. So that's what they wanted to do, uh, is be able to load it standalone. Now, the thing you have to remember, right, the, the big thing about debugging is make sure you're doing an apples to apples comparison, right? You can't test something on this computer in one way and then carry it over to this computer and run it in a completely different way and expect your debugging to be 100% done. For example, when you are running something as a function in the console, what credentials is it running under? Yours, unless you launch the console using run as, but whatever credential launched the console is what's running that code. When you run that same code under the local configuration manager, whose credentials is it running under? system, basically, which is either a godlike account or a zero privilege account, depending on what it's trying to do at the time, right? Um, so that is something you have to keep in mind. There is a certain amount of testing that can only be done by actually sticking this thing into the LCM and letting it run. So you're not going to be able to debug everything this way, but knowing that that difference exists is important. So here's, here's kind of where they decided to go. Um, we talked about that a bit. The general goal, you've got in the brown or orange on the left side here, you've got your get, set, and test. So in version four, those are functions. In version five, those become methods of a class. But you've got three hunks of code that the LCM is going to attempt to run, the get, the set, and the test. Their goal was to put as little code as possible into those three functions. Now in version four, those are the only three you export from your module, but you can have lots of private functions floating around inside the thing. And so they want the majority of their code to live in three or more, some other number of functions that exist internally, that, that can't be seen elsewhere. Now we're gonna, we're gonna get more specific with how that structure winds up looking, but this was kind of their goal. And then there's also a log, and that's important for debugging. And as you sit down and start actually coding a resource, you need to have already decided where you're going to log information. Um, some folks will just use the verbose channel, so they'll use a lot of write verbose statements, and their intent is when I run this thing, I'm going to do start DSC configuration minus wait, right, which will just show you all that verbose stuff interactively. Um, I don't like that because it's not super scalable. It in a lot of situations, you've got remote machines, it's, it's not really the best way to do it. I think you should really think about using a log. Now, that might be a text log that you just spew out to the machine if that's what you want. You could write to the event log, which DSC itself does. There is a log resource that you can use to do some, some level of logging at the configuration level. Whatever you decide to do, think about it being scalable. You need to be able to run this across 100 test machines, not just one test machine and you need to be able to capture pretty detailed information. Uh, just to point out, I mean, that using the verbose output is still good because it goes into the event log. Using, using verbose is still decent because when it runs under the LCM, it will capture that into the event log. So there, there is still use for that. As a quick sidebar, what do you think you should be logging? Everybody says everything, but what does that actually mean? I found the most useful log stuff really revolves around two, two things. Thing number one, status, where am I? So every time you're about to do some major thing, I'm trying to delete a file, trying to connect, something that might break, log a message saying that you're about to do it and then log a message saying that you think you did it, right? Um, this is a case where you probably cannot be overly verbose. You would generally rather have way too much information than too little. So that's the first thing, status. Most people get that. Most people don't put enough in. I am about to run the test. Okay, that's a ton of code though, so can you break it down for me and give me some more detail? 
whether they're in verbose or not, wherever you decide to log, that's what you log. Um, I actually have one customer who is pushing everything into a SQL server because they've got a lot of tools that are already aggregating that type of information and it makes it easier for them to query and pull their log information out. Where you log it is less important for this discussion. So that's thing one, status information. Thing two, this is the big one. This is the thing nobody does. This is the thing you should be doing. Anytime you're about to do something that depends on the value that's in a property or a variable, output the property or the variable. I am about to connect to dollar sign computer. Not just attempting to connect to the computer, but if you're about to use a variable, show me what's in the variable. That is the biggest thing you can possibly do. 99% of the bugs I run into, whether it's DSC or not, is because you thought a variable or property contained something and it contains something different. So if you can see what's in there, you will probably find your bug a lot faster. I like to do both. I like to say this is what the property was and this is what I'm changing. And if you're, if you're changing a variable or a property, this is what it was, this is what I'm changing it to. Yeah. Detail, right? Yeah, okay, so, and so his point here is that when you're outputting the contents of a property or a variable, delimit that in your text string somehow. The variable contains square bracket, variable name, square bracket. That way if the variable is empty, and you, you'll get the two delimiters right up against each other and you'll be able to visually tell very easily that it is in fact empty. And you can use regular expressions to pour through your log and find those delimiters more easily. So all good tips. All right, so what we've got here on the left is your exported functions. Those are the things that DSC demands to see. And then you've got private stuff internally. Uh, and we're gonna start digging into the structure a little bit better. But in general, here's the approach. The LCM will run your exported, let's say, get. It is then going to run an internal function that actually does all the work. And that, the reason why will become apparent in a little bit and it is going to log whatever it's doing to whatever log you have decided to use. Same thing with the set. It's going to really just be calling an internal function to do all this information. And then the test also calls another internal function, but test and get are nearly the same thing logically. Right? What's the difference? What's the return value from a test function? True or false, right? But to get that true or false, you actually have to go get the configuration and then look at it, right? So part of what test is doing is really the same thing that the get does. So this is where the modularization starts to come in. Most of your code should live in your internal get and your internal set. And your test is really just doing the get and then deciding if that matches what it's been ordered to do or not. So your internal test should really be fairly minimal. Call the get and then what a lot of folks will do, right? A DSC version four passes all this configuration information around in a hash table. So the test is gonna get a hash table saying what the config should look like. The get really should output that same kind of hash table and then you can just compare object the two. And if there's any differences, then you're not compliant and it's a false. And that's, not going to cover you in every situation, but that's just kind of the you know mental approach you have. I have heard that frequently because test is run so often, you want it to return as quickly. So sometimes you, you test does get run often. Fail you, you as soon as you hit the first item. So okay, we'll talk about that. That's a good point. And the point is this: is that if your get is checking fifty-seven different things. Why would you not check the first one? And if that's different, fail it immediately because you only need one true or false. We'll get there. We, did, we have to break this down just a little bit more. I, I actually had the same thought originally, but as it turns out, like 99% of the time, you're, you're in the correct state, so you're going to have to check everything anyway when test runs. So it's actually not that it, it depends a little bit on, on how complex your, your get really is. Right. And, and we'll talk about how I've seen people break that down a bit. It turns out that your set 
and this discussion is actually building up into that point. You're just two seconds ahead of me. It turns out your set often has to call a lot of gets also because you're not gonna change something unless it needs to be changed. Let's take something that's really important. I'm gonna change your domain membership. Well, I'm not just gonna blindly set that. I'm gonna check to see if it needed to be changed first because just setting it is a tremendously impactful thing. So I'm not gonna do it unless it has to be done. So it turns out that your set is almost always also going to be doing the get type stuff. I need you to set the domain name. Well, keep in mind, the only reason set got called is because test was false, but you don't know what about it was false. So now the set has got to go, okay, well, I've got these eight things I have to do. Here's the first one. I'm going to go check it first. Then I'm going to check the second one. Then I'm, oh, this one needs to be changed. So I'll change that. Then I have to check the third one. So the point of this approach here is to try and get, uh, let's, let's think of these as two separate things. Let's call them the the select, which is my query, let's see what situation I'm in, and my set, which is put it into place, your queries should all be separate so that they live in one spot. Now, even in the resource kit resources, you won't always see that level of modularization. You'll see queries happening, the same code copied and pasted in three different places. That makes your maintenance a little bit harder. But we're going to talk a little bit about how I've seen customers start to break this down and make it really, really nice and modular. What they'll do is take every single tiny little thing that they might want to query as the configuration and make it into a separate function. So now, when I run test, I might be calling eight different functions and just doing a Boolean on them to determine if the result, final result is true or false. That makes it a little bit easier if you just want to query the first one. Oh, no, first one's out, so I'm not even going to bother with the other five. I'll just output a false right now and I'm done. So really start breaking it down. The smaller these are, the better. Like if one of these is doing nothing but one WMI query, that's OK. It's not going to run significantly slower or faster either way. But by having them broken down, you make it really easy to call them in tiny little increments so that you're set. OK, you need to make sure these things are true. OK, first one's fine, second one's fine, third one needs to be fixed. Now you can debug each of these separately. Every time you separate something, you make it easier to debug just that one thing because it's got a little wall around it, right? If every single one of your, your mini gets only does one thing, how hard are they to debug? They're not that hard. So the more you can break this down, the easier the testing and debugging can become. Because they're each so tiny, and they've got so few moving parts, that if they break, you should be able to look right at what's breaking. So the approach uh, with these customers has been to get your get functionality as absolutely granular as you possibly can. One tiny little itsy bitsy bit. Your exported, your official get target resource then just calls those in order, assembles its output hash table, and spews it out as the result of the function. Meaning your real, you know, your, your exported get target resource isn't doing anything. You don't need to test that really. The functionality lives in these other things. Yeah? So far, all of this lives in one giant PSM1 file. You've got your get target resource, your set target resource, your test target resource, a whole slew of actual doing the work functions. And then at the bottom, you've got an export module member that's just exporting get, set, and test target resource. So the other ones are, are hidden, right? That model makes this reasonably easy to test. You comment out your export module member. That lets you load this module interactively in the console. And all of your private functions are now visible as commands you can run. And more importantly, if you give them unique names, it becomes very easy to run them interactively in the console. The biggest problem with loading DSC resources in manually is that they're all called get target resource, test target. So you can't have more than one loaded, or you have to start doing the long, fully qualified naming convention to run them. 
But by getting your functionality into functions that have unique names, you can load them interactively in the shell, play with them, look at their output, look at their verbose output, look at what they've logged, look at what they're producing, and test each one interactively, which is much easier. Then you can uncomment your export module member so that DSC only sees the three it wants to see, and then you can start running it as a real resource. Make sense so far? Questions, comments, anyone care for a mint? Mint? I have laptop stickers. We'll be giving those out tonight. Are they mint flavored? Um, they're not, I don't know. <laughs> One of them is a, is a guy with the PowerShell logo, uh, and the other is a nano server. Yeah. Those are mine. Those are for me. Uh, yeah, we'll find a way to give these out tonight. Yeah, and you can tell me if they're mint flavored. <laughs> so that's your approach for your get. For your set, you're nearly always going to have this calling a get, one of your mini gets first, to see if it needs to do anything. And then you want to probably break your, your set into minis. So get thing number one, it's fine. Get thing number two, oh, it's not fine. Call set number two to mitigate it and so on. So your sets also get broken out. Again, making them very, very granular. Now, how many of you, when you test your DSC stuff, your target node is a virtual machine? How many, how many is that not the case for? Because always make it a virtual machine. Always test in the VM. You know why? One word, two syllables rhymes with snapshot. Because every time you screw up, you can revert the snapshot and get your fresh environment and run it again. Makes it a lot easier. One of the problems people have is prior to the patched DSC 1.1 or whatever we're calling it, it was a little bit difficult to get DSC to reapply a configuration when it didn't want to. You had to kind of go in and flick the repository in the nose to make it do something. A little easier to do that now. but. Think of it this way, if every test is on a fresh VM that you just came back from the snapshot, you can start DSC configuration and it'll take it right then because it's a fresh thing. And if it screws up, roll it back, do it over again. So VMs, awesome for testing, awesome snapshots, use that functionality. A uh, lot simpler. So your exported set function here, your set target resource, essentially becomes what I call a controller function. It's not doing anything. It is coordinating several other smaller things. So your get and your set both get very broken down. And then your test is really just calling all the gets and doing a little Boolean logic to determine if they're all true or false. And at some point, it spews either a true or a false. This makes it easy to take the approach of test one thing. If it's true, I'll, I'll keep testing one at a time until I hit a false. And then I stop, spew a false, and go on my way. The other thing this does is it lets you be a little tactical. Let's say you've got eight different things that you need to check. Think about which ones are going to be computationally expensive and put them at the end of the list. Right? If something is going to involve a, a, you know, a 30 second lookup somewhere on the machine, do that one last. Get the easy ones done so that you're only doing the hard one if that's the last one. Right? So that you can bail out of this test really, really quickly. Like checking the computer name, super, super easy. Check that first. That's quick, get it over with. If that's, if that's false, you don't even need to do anything else. You can just bail right out. And by having these broken down granularly, it makes it really, really simple. Good so far? Logging approach. Um, you, again, really, really, really need to go into this with the idea that this is always going to run on a headless machine. You will not be able to see the machine. You will not be able to touch the machine. You should plan to log everything. Now, if you're relying on the verbose and the LCM capturing that pipeline and moving into the log, that's fine. If you're logging it elsewhere, that's fine. Whatever you choose to use as your logging strategy. I would sit and talk to the other folks in your environment about a comprehensive logging strategy that you will use all the time. Write yourself a little helper function that will take care of that. I, for example, most of the customers I'm working with have quit using write verbose directly in their functions. Instead, they have written their own little logging function. And even if all it's doing is write verbose, it lets them go change that to something else more easily if they want to. 
Um, I had one customer that, this is the one that decided they were gonna stick everything in SQL Server, and it was a, a two lines of code, and they changed all of their DSC resources from using Verbose to their SQL Server, because they had modularized it. Um, so consider that. Uh, and that's what this private log info function turned into for them. Here's the big thing. Okay, so design principle, right? In our heads, we've got our exported functions that DSC needs to see, right? Three of them. And then we've got this huge basket full of private getters and setters and a tester, right? With me? Break that into two separate modules now. Your actual DSC resource <laughs> module has your exported get set test. But then you've got another totally normal, not anything special PowerShell script module that has all the other stuff. Now in version four, the way I've had customers doing this, because in version four, right, you've got a root module. Right? If you physically look at this thing on disk, you've got a root module, and then you've got a DSC resources folder, and that's where all your resource modules get laddered out. They put all of their real functionality in the root module because you're gonna distribute that in the zip file anyway, but what it lets them do is just load that up like a normal PowerShell module and run all that crap without having DSC involved in any way, shape, or form. Then they can get all their hard debugging out of the way interactively if they need to. It's easier. Here's how one customer came up with the, uh, again, credentials, right? What's the LCM use? Well, if you're running it interactively, you're not actually testing apples to apples, right? Because you're running it under your credentials, which are probably more powerful. Here's what they did. They wrote themselves a little batch file, a little PS1, that just called all of their functions and then scheduled that to run under task scheduler as system, which is more or less how the LCM runs anyway. So after they got all their hard debugging out of the way, they set up a separate schedule task that they could kick off now, run now, and then they could just gather that log output that they had produced. DSC's not involved, so that takes one piece of complexity out of the picture, but it gets you closer to that apples to apples because now it's running under the same account. Keeping in mind, as you're going through and you're writing your resources, anytime you're accessing something that's not on the physical machine, you're going to have to worry about credentials. If you're typing a, a double backslash for a UNC, you need to stop yourself and ask how the system account is supposed to do that. And you got a code for credentials. I'm just gonna query AD real quick. No, you're not. I'm just gonna, mm -mm. I'll, I'll just invoke a command, probably not. So really, really think about that as you're coding these things and that makes that apples to apples comparison with the system account much, much easier. So the principle here is your one module contains those three exported and then it has a hash requires so that it requires your traditional module where all the actual functionality winds up living. Those are still invisible when DSC uses it because included modules are, fall under the, the export module member rules. DSC will still only see the three it wants to see, but then your functionality lives in something that's completely standalone and a lot easier to test. It's easier to remote into whatever machine you're having problems with, load that module, and just play with it and get it working. Because you always want to test on the machine where it's going to run, right? Apples to apples. The other advantage to doing that is that you, you tend to write little families of related DSC resources, and there's frequently very common code. Yeah, you, you tend to write kind of families of related things in DSC resources. This gives you a common code repository for all the hard stuff. The other thing this does is, how many of you uh, are in an environment that has other human beings? <laughs> I hate that. <laughs> this makes it a lot easier for different people to own different bits because they can do unit testing much, much easier knowing that when they hand that unit to you, it should run the same way because it's a unit. Uh, so it makes it a lot easier to delegate and get a team working together. Where am I putting the root module? So uh, the layout of your, your DSC resources is the, the first level of, so 
Windows Power C program files, Windows PowerShell modules, my module name, that's where the root module lives. And then under that, you've got a slash DSC resources subfolder, which breaks down all the, the settings that that resource can handle. It's just PSM1. Yep. Super simple. The root module has to have a manifest in order for DSC to be able to load the whole thing, but the module itself is just a PSM1. Yeah, the PSD1 is always there, and that's, so what you normally have with a resource is just the PSD1 at the root, and it's called an empty root. This just proposes putting something in it. Downsides. This should not significantly complicate resource deployment because you are already going to be zipping up that whole thing into a zip file. I do have customers who, leave, who do not use the root module approach. They take all of their functional code and put it in a separate module. That then does complicate their deployment a little bit because DSC is not going to deploy that for you in quite the same way. There's still ways to do it. It's, it's definitely not an insurmountable problem. Um, I've never gotten a really clear answer from those customers on why they prefer that approach. So I'm thinking it's just religion, but they've chosen to deal with it that way so they can. Um, you can do, and this, this all essentially carries over to version five as well. Again, because we're not talking so much about syntax. This is the broad structure and it, it structures out pretty much the same. Um, your functional module your traditional module where all of your actual bits are living doesn't need to be easily loaded. You don't necessarily have to have a, a full manifest for it, although there's no reason not to. Uh, it just needs to be possible to load it in independently so that you can do testing. So to broadly restate the goal here, this minimizes the code that's actually in the DSC resource. The DSC resource stops becoming a set of tools and starts becoming just a controller that leverages tools from elsewhere, making those tools easier to run on their own. That make kind of sense? The more you can get out of that context easily, the easier your testing and debugging becomes. That also, it doesn't force you, believe me, people can still screw this up, but it certainly encourages you to think about tiny, tiny chunks of code. Smaller chunks of code, easier to debug, easier to write, easier to spread across a team every time. Now, where this falls apart is if you've got one script jockey pumping all this out, and he's like, man, it's killing me to have to type the function keyword 10 times. Ugh. Well, first of all, snippets, dude, right? <laughs> um, if you've got one person doing everything, they tend to get into this monolithic approach of, okay, here's my get. Uh, 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 uh. Going back afterwards and modularizing that is just boring and painful and no one wants to do it. So you really kind of have to take a management approach of this is how we're going to do it and we're not going to accept anything that isn't done this way. So this is a, a cultural thing that has to happen first. And if it's, yeah, but you haven't met the guy who's doing our programming, well, maybe he should be fired. Maybe he shouldn't be doing your programming. That's a human resources problem, really. Um, test strategy here a little bit, bit, a bit of a sidebar. Your, your test function, uh, as well as your get and your set, uh, these things accept a hash table, right? That's their input. Internally, your test target resource should then have your get generate a matching hash table and it becomes easier to do a compare object. Now, the, the only reason you wouldn't do an entire thing is if you know bits of your configuration are going to be computationally expensive to check and you choose to break those out for that reason. But the more that your test can be a run the get, compare two hash tables, the easier it becomes to work with because you can do that manually from the command line and get the same type of logic result out of it. Now, version five. Um, obviously, everybody, anybody played with version 5 yet? Well, the rest of you should be. Um, how many of you have not played with version 5? Here's a fun tip. Once they ship it, they can't fix it real easily. <laughs> so if you find bugs now and report them on Connect, they actually have a shot in hell of shipping something that works. So get involved, right? Don't install it on your production servers. 
Um, every time someone on PowerShell.org hops in the forums, yeah, I'm running version 5 on 300 of our production servers, stop. Don't do that. Um, you really should be involved with 5. You should be testing it. That's what beta is for. Uh, it's not just a chance for you to play with the new thing. They don't put it out there for that reason. They put it out there to get the feedback. The feedback's helpful. Um, he manager, they take the feedback? They like, they like the feedback. He, that, he's in charge of all this. Now he's going to run away. Um, version 5 introduces classes. So it gives us a more, a more declarative structure. Uh, you no longer are on the honor system for making sure you name your functions the right thing. Trust me, I have debugged T-S-E-T dash target resource more than a few times before I realized I had misspelled the word test. Um, the classes let the shell uh, it just kind of tell you that you've done that. It forces you into a pattern. The patterns we've talked about here, the structural approach survives. The syntax is different in five, but the structure is largely the same. Uh, so the design pattern should still work. I've got a couple of customers that are trialing moving a lot of their version 4 resources over to the class-based style, and it's been going very smoothly for them. It's, 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 it's almost a copy and paste type of, type of change. You can almost do a find, replace, and get there. Inefficiencies. Um, 10 mini gets. So we've talked about these mini gets, right? 10 mini gets that are each querying SIM and setting up a session on their own gets expensive. You gotta set up the session, gotta make the query, shut down the session. Set up the session, right? If every single one of these is querying and generating its own session, that can get computationally a little bit more expensive. I mean, we're not talking a huge deal, but it, it's a thing. Because your mini gets are being run by your test and because the test gets run every 30 minutes minimum, uh, it, can, it adds up over time. So one approach I've seen is to actually, in that module, set a module level variable so that your, your first thing creates the connection and then passes that as input to your mini gets and they just use that connection, which is then closed by the controlling function. So there are a few things it makes sense to share in some situations, but number one rule about PowerShell is if you think performance matters, you have to test it. Don't just sit and have a cerebral discussion on whether this is faster or slower. Put it to the test and find out, right? Make sure you do that. Um, but I, I do have customers that have set things up this way. They have a private new MySim session, uh, sets it up, returns the resulting session, gets stored as a module level variable, and then it gets passed into all their getters and setters just to save a little bit of setup time. Um, so as much as possible though, and this is key, I don't want to walk around and see anybody using dollar sign global. <laughs> if you're setting up something that's meant to be shared between a bunch of functions, they accept that something via an input parameter. Because then when you are on the command line by yourself, testing it interactively, you can pass that information in via a parameter. You don't have to set up some wacky global level variable. Right? It's fine to have a variable to store a thing, but it gets passed in on a parameter, not simply by allowing the scope rules to make it happen, right? Having a function access anything other than what came in via parameter sends you to hell. <laughs> third, third level of hell, right off. Um, some cautions, again, avoid relying on any non-local resources as much as possible. Your resources should be executing entirely against the local machine. There's obviously exceptions. Uh, I need to go get a package source from somewhere else. Try to avoid reinventing the wheel. You're all aware that there's a core resource for copying files, right? So your configuration should have it copying the files and then whatever needs those has a depends on for that. Don't go reinventing, I'm just gonna have my own file copy routines. It's been done, just use what they have, unless there's a really solid reason not to. Um, dealing with credentials in DSC is a pain in the butt. Just because you don't want them in clear text, who's building configurations with clear text passwords? Where do you work? What's your uh, address? <laughs> IP address would be fine. Um, 
It's okay in, in a test environment, I get it, but as you move to production, your pull server should be running HTTPS. I swear to God, when you wind up on CNN because you got hacked, because you were using an HTTP pull server, I am going to make sure you tell everyone that I told you to do it differently and you just chose not to, Mr. I work for Target, okay? Um, so if you're dealing with credentials the right way, and you better be, they're a pain in the butt, but that's just, security is the opposite of convenience. That's the way it is. Try to log things locally. The customer I told you that's logging things to a SQL server had to do a significant amount of setup on that SQL server so that it would, what they chose to do, um, they have it accepting anonymous connections from their known internal IP addresses strictly for writing data to a particular table via means of a stored procedure. So I mean, they've, they've got it pretty rigidly locked up, but they didn't want to have to worry about how credentials were going to happen so they're taking essentially unauthenticated credentials. Anytime you're dealing with a non-local resource, it's going to be a pain in the butt. Uh, try to minimize inf information sharing between the functional bits, your mini gets and your mini sets. They should really be standalone. Anything they need to share should be part of their output and their input, not via module level variables. That's goofy. Uh, makes your debugging a lot simpler, trust me. Uh, logging strategy. Using the inbuilt diagnostics is fine. Uh, I've seen people do a lot of stuff with uh, text file dumps that have worked very well. Here's what they'll do. They'll put all the logging functionality again into a separate function and they might only use it in their test environment. And then they'll just go return out of it or comment out the body of it when they deploy the thing into production so that it, it essentially does nothing. But they'll even do stuff like run dir variable out file. So periodically their functions will just say, here's all the variables, blah. And it gets dumped to a text file because that's something easy to pick up and scan through. And it gives them a lot of information with very little work on their part. Um, and just do keep in mind that your hardest bugs do involve variables and properties. It's, that's nearly always the case. Uh, basic debugging tip that I tell people as they're getting started in debugging, this very much applies to DSC. You need to be able to sit and run the code in your head and write down what you think the properties and the variables are going to contain, and then run the code in the shell and verify that that was true, because any place where it's different is your bug, like nine times out of time. If you're looking at the code, and sometimes I will print the stuff on paper, the, the dead tree, I will print it, and if I can't tell what it's doing, I can't even start debugging it. So I start having to look up what the commands are doing and everything else. You've got to know what your expectations are. Um, apples to apples is the important thing for debugging. You cannot sit down and run something interactively and that be the final determination of whether or not it's going to work when it runs under the LCM. You've got to have apples to apples. That means your logging strategy has eventually got to accommodate this thing running under the LCM, unattended, headless, unseen. You've got to be able to deal with that situation because that's what the actual end production result's going to be. Test on the same machine, the same context as much as possible, using the same data Right? Your input hash tables that you create when you're debugging interactively have to look the same as what the LCM is going to feed it, which means you're going to have to have some logging to see what that was so that you can duplicate it when you get back into. You need to be logging what all your input is. Because if the LCM is feeding you something goofy and you're not testing with something goofy, you're not going to find your bug. So you've got to see what the LCM is feeding you and that's where the logging comes in. Um, don't change anything about your input data. Keep everything apples to apples as much as possible. And for credentials, make sure you understand the difference between impersonation and delegation. Who knows the difference? Uh-oh. One dude over there. Who does not know the difference? Impersonation is when I give you my username and password and you log on as me. That's what the LCM does when you feed it credentials. Delegation is when I log on to my machine initiate a connection to a remote machine and pass it a Kerberos ticket and it uses that but it doesn't know my password. It just has my, my security key. Delegation by default can't traverse more than one hop. Delegation is also difficult for the system account to do in a, a default situation which is why it's largely built around impersonation. Understand the difference. If you're giving someone a password, they're probably impersonating you. They're logging on as you. That's a new log on, a new session, a new life. If you're delegating, you're usually not giving a password, and there's limitations on what that can do and where it can go from there. 
All right, about five minutes. Any, any last questions, any thoughts, any feelings? Yeah, so my test target resources usually don't ever get broken down. My test target resource is just calling one mini get and then the next mini get and the next mini get. And it's looking at the input logic to determine if what it got matches what it was input. So I usually have that logic in one place. I usually don't need to do mini tests because you're really just comparing two values. Uh, your set function is actually not doing the mini tests. It's doing the mini gets. It's doing the test logic also. Right. Because a lot of times the order will be different based on what you feel is computationally expensive or not. And in, in some cases, for example, in a test situation, I want my computationally expensive stuff to go at the end, but there's no dependencies. At the end of the day, it's an all or nothing value. For the sets, I want to do the computationally expensive stuff last, but there might be dependencies. I can't do this until I join the domain. So the order of them might wind up being different. So I just usually have them calling the gets and comparing the values directly. OK, I'm pushing the button. I hope that did something.